Today's scripture reading is Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 33, New International Version. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate the father and mother, wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. If anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, say, that fellow began to build and was not able to finish it. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able to, whether he is able with ten thousand men to oppose the one coming against him with twenty thousand? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot. Be my disciple. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning again, everyone. Good morning. How are you doing today? Thank you. Wonderful. I'm glad to hear that. I'm going to ask you then to just look around the room a little bit and wave to somebody uh, with that intention of saying it's good to see you. good to be here again in the company of believers, the saints of God, as we are gathered to give God worship and to give ourselves to the Word of God. And today we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion, a remembrance of what God has done for all of humanity. Let us again offer our prayers. God, we pray that you would bless your words into our hearts and glorify your name. And let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Today I wish to focus on the topic of being a disciple. Uh, last week we talked a bit about humility and uh, referencing a passage from the book of Proverbs, that pride goes before a fall and that the Lord despises the proud. And we talked about what humility really means uh, for us as we consider ourselves as followers of Jesus Christ, as disciples of Jesus Christ. Today then, Jesus wants to challenge us again to consider what it means to be his disciple. Over the many years, we have, in Christendom, talked quite a bit about who is a disciple, or who a disciple is, and what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And we have basically simplified it to say that a disciple is anyone who follows Jesus. And that, in itself, is quite a profound statement. To follow Jesus. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Is it that we simply come to church and we sing some songs and hymns and we listen to a sermon and then we go back home and we may participate in some committee meetings throughout the course of the week. We may take part in some church program or some church events throughout the course of the week. And we repeat that cycle each year, or each week, or each month. I dare to say that it extends beyond simply being part of a church. Because there are many of us unfortunate, and I've been contending along this line for many years, 
But there are many of us who unfortunately have not yet had that encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying that's the case here at Ebenezer, of course. But that encounter that transforms and changes, that encounter that causes us to see the world through different lenses, that encounter that transforms our speech, that transforms our actions, that, that transforms our thought life, our thought processes. We behave differently, we think differently, we speak differently. Is that not what the Apostle Paul says? 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, if anyone be in Christ, he or she is a new creation, the old has passed, and behold, the new has come. Romans 12, verses 1 to 2, I beseech you, therefore, to give yourselves as living sacrifices unto God, holy and acceptable, for this is your reasonable act of service. Be not conformed to this world, or to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you will be able to test and to see what is the good and perfect will of God for your lives. And I could go on and on quoting scriptures that challenge us about being disciples. But I want to be a bit more faithful to the text today that we are contemplating, and that's Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 25 through 33. And I would also add to that verses 34 and 35. So, with this very short subunit in the journey section, and this is Jesus' journey, Jesus' attention turns almost totally to his disciples. Well, Jesus is probably saying, probably saying to his disciples, now you've seen all this, you've heard all this, so I want you to understand what it means. The leadership has been warned and rebuked, and we encountered that over the past couple of weeks when Jesus had those encounters, those very tense encounters with the Pharisees. The leaders of Judaism who had a serious problem with him healing on the Sabbath or doing good deeds on the Sabbath. So we saw where Jesus warned and rebuked them. But what does following Jesus really require? You know, the previous parable hinted that other issues became higher priorities. And by previous parable, I'm referring to Jesus healing the man who had that sickness, the scripture refers to it as dropsy, or the woman who was bent over for 18 years and had that hunch, and Jesus healed her. But we saw where in Jesus doing this, it was revealed that there were, there, there were higher priorities than doing what was right and doing what was good on the Sabbath. The rulers and the leaders made it a point to suggest that observing what they understood to be the Sabbath was more important than ushering in God's kingdom. For did not Jesus say in Luke's Gospel chapter 4, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to heal the sick, to restore sight to the blind, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And this is what Jesus was doing with me in these encounters with the Pharisees who snubbed the ushering in of the kingdom of God. Because they had higher priorities for the original invitees to the kingdom of God. And this single unit will make it clear that disciples should count the cost of following Jesus because success will not 
come easily and when we seek to do what is right we will always face challenges opposition and even persecution for Jesus it took him to the cross for surely those leaders plotted and planned how they might get rid of Jesus because of the things that he was doing and saying. So this passage is unique to Luke. Though verses 26 to 27 are like those in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 37 to 38, and verses 34 to 35, are similar to Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, and Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 49 to 50. Significantly, this passage is addressed to large crowds. Jesus offered himself to all, but he also was honest from the very beginning of his preaching about what the journey would involve. What Jesus asks for is the first place in everyone's heart. That is what successful discipleship requires. Except that Jesus Christ is number one. Number one. And except that Jesus Christ is one and only. Then Jesus is saying, I cannot be his disciple. You cannot be his disciple. We cannot be his disciples. Jesus must reign on the thrones of our hearts, must govern our lives, must direct our thoughts, our speech, and our actions. We must fall in total submission and surrender in obedience to him for us to be his disciples. In other words, Jesus is saying, forget everything else that you know and come and follow me. If you're unable to do that, then you cannot be my disciples. That's tough to hear. But it's going to get even tougher as we go further in the text and hear what Jesus has to say. So Jesus calls for a follower who will hate his mother and father, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his or her very own life. Wow. Does any of us inside here hate our lives? Apart from the fact that things are not so nice right now with the pandemic and all the struggles, but apart from that, does any of us here hate our lives? Apart from the fact that you may be having some niggling pains here and there, or your health might not be the best, but do you really hate your life? Is there any of us here who is wishing to die? Who would rather be dead than be alive? Who would rather not be here with our families and our friends? Is there any of us who would rather not see our children, not see our spouses, would rather not have known all the blessings and the beauty of being in this life, despite all its many challenges and difficulties? I think I might get a resounding no as a collective response. The point of the list here that Jesus outlines, hating mother, hating father, hating wife and children, hating brothers and sisters, the point of this list is that no other relationship is first for a disciple of Jesus Christ. There can be no relationship that we have to anyone else or to anything else in this world that can be more important to you or to me or to us than our relationship with Jesus Christ. That is the point that Jesus is making. 
that our relationship with him must be the most important. I, 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 said, I will say again, it gets even tougher. Because here Jesus is challenging us and saying that you must be even willing to let go of those you love the most for my sake. Not easy words to hear. Now, when Jesus uses the word hate, hate is used figuratively. Not literally, but figuratively. And suggests a priority of a relationship. Jesus is first. To follow Jesus means to follow Jesus, not anyone or anything else. To listen to Jesus first, not anyone or anything else. To submit to Jesus alone, not anyone or anything else. A disciple then is one who submits to the instructions of his or her teacher, in our case, that is Jesus. A disciple is a learner and the primary teacher for us, the only real teacher for us, is Jesus himself. This total loyalty is crucial given the rejection and the persecution that lie ahead for those who will follow Jesus. So, do you recall that story about the mother of the sons of Zebedee, James and John? How she went to Jesus and she pleaded with him, asked her, when you come into your kingdom, will you cause one of my sons to sit on your left and the other on your right? But she wasn't prepared for Jesus' response, for Jesus responded to her. Are they able to drink of the cup that I will drink? And this cup was that which represented the son of being a servant of God. The suffering that entails being a disciple of Jesus Christ. That you and I will have to bear a cross. So in this very text, Jesus says, if anyone come after me, let him, let her deny self, take up his or her cross daily and follow me. What is the cross of Jesus Christ? It represents, first and foremost, death. The dying of self. And the rebirth to new life. That's what happens when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our lives. That self dies and Jesus Christ raises us to new life. That's what baptism signifies. That when we are immersed beneath the water. It is symbolic of dying, going under, being submerged, being submitted. But when we're raised back from that water, it is symbolic of being raised to new life. So Jesus says that we must die to self and be raised to new life. If any would come after me. Again, these are not easy words to hear. But as we contemplate what it means to be followers of Jesus, if his followers care more about family than about Jesus, when families are divided under the pressure of persecution, then his followers will choose against him. 
This is what lies behind Jesus' remarks. Discipleship is not possible if Jesus is not the teacher and we follow Jesus' instructions. So again, we come back to the cross and taking up the cross. Not only does the cross signify and is symbolic of death, but it represents rejection. Jesus was crucified on the cross because he was rejected by the powers of the time. He was rejected by the masses. So will you and I be rejected when we walk according to Jesus' model for our lives, when we live according to Jesus' instructions, when we seek to do that which is just, when we seek to live a righteous and holy life. Not only does the cross signify rejection, but it also signifies shame. That yes, my friends, we will be put to shame. We will be put to shame by those who would scoff at what we do and what we believe and what we have to say. Calling us crazes, loonies, or whatever it is that they call us, fanatics, radicals, or whatever it is that they call us as Christians in an attempt to shame us into obedience to the way of the world. And how has the church been shamed into following that pattern over these many years? As a matter of fact, we look at the church now today and it is almost unrecognizable from what the church was according to the scriptures. Because we are so much more inclined to fit in than to stand out. We do not want to stand out. We do not want to cause a stir. We do not want to rock the boat. We do not want to ruffle the feathers of people. But that's what disciples do. Did they not cut the head off Stephen? I'm oh, sorry, Peter. Did they not stone Stephen to death? Did they not crucify? Others who were disciples of Jesus because they went against the grain of the time. There are so many things in today's world that the church needs to call out or to proclaim the gospel in such a way that it convicts the hearts and the minds of men and women who will rise up with vile contempt to destroy those who proclaim the word of God. Because that's what the truth does. It hurts. It hurts to the core. None of us likes when somebody else tells us the truth about ourselves, especially when it's an ugly truth. We spurn such an experience. It is not something that's palatable or desirable for any of us. So it is with the Word of God, for the Word of God is like a mirror. And when we put the Word of God up before us, we see a reflection of ourselves. But not just the reflection of ourselves, we see the image of Christ challenging us to be better than the reflection of ourselves that we see in the mirror of the Word. The Word of God reveals our innermost thoughts. It reveals our innermost desires. All those things that if we should be caught open spiritually today, we would be ashamed for others to see that we think those things, that we wanted that person beside us to die, that we would have rather not have had an encounter with some of these people we're simply merely tolerating them because we're trying to be good people. Thank God that my thoughts are kept secret by God. Otherwise, I'd be embarrassed to walk in public. Imagine if everyone could read your thoughts or see your thoughts. 
or you've known some of the things that, that I have done or you have done. But as disciples of Jesus Christ and called to proclaim this word, it's not an easy word to hear by those who will not have it. But it's a cross that we must bear as being disciples of Jesus Christ. This is why bearing the cross and coming after Jesus is the main and perhaps the only issue of discipleship. Learning from Jesus means following him, experiencing the rejection he experienced, and so bearing the cross he bore. We cannot learn Jesus without being prepared to walk this path. Discipleship is basically allegiance. To follow Jesus is to rely on him. The Apostle Paul makes the same point in his imagery in Romans chapter 6. Two pictures illustrate the teaching. Though each has a slightly different point, the first picture involves the building. The building of what is probably a watchtower for a vineyard. To be a success, the building program must be planned out carefully. Otherwise, the builder may well start the project but not finish it. Failure to finish would make the builder a laughing stock to neighbors. And his half finished shell, or her half finished shell, or shell of a tower, casts its incomplete shadow over the land. So Jesus asks, What person does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has or she has enough money to complete it? How sad it is to start something and not finish it. The failure is evident to all. So verse 30 expresses the public response in very mocking terms as all around belittle this fellow. The shell of the building echoes the shell that remains of this man's reputation. The implication is that embarking on discipleship is just the same. We do well to reflect on what it will take to finish what we have started before we even start. The second picture is of a king who finds his forces outnumbered as he considers going to battle. After calculating the cost in terms of destruction, he decides that appealing for peace is a better idea. The king reflects then. So many readers take this to be a second example of taking stock, just like the first illustration. But there may be something more here. In the case of the building of the tower, all the options lay with the builder. In the case of potential war, the situation is forced on the king. Only a foolish king would try to take on a stronger foe when he is outnumbered two to one. So it is prudent to seek peace with the stronger foe. There is a more powerful one than Satan to deal with in life. And that one is God. It is wise to count the cost of facing God. And we all will face God someday. There are benefits of aligning ourselves with God rather than having Him as a decidedly stronger enemy. The application Jesus states without apology. In the same way, anyone who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus must be first. Those who are disposed to oppose God's will should not, should count the cost. Much better to 
pursue peace or to seek peace with God on God's terms. God's terms for peace are precious, but disciples must acknowledge that God is the source of life and of spiritual well-being. And I close with these thoughts from verses 34 and 35 that were not read today. So Jesus says this, what good is salt if it has lost its saltiness, but to be thrown out and to be trampled under the feet of persons? Salt is good as long as it is salty. If not, it is to be thrown away. Now, we can make of that what we wish, but Jesus says that we are the salt of the earth. His disciples are the salt of the earth. In other words, what the salt does, salt gives flavor. Salt preserves. Salt heals. Salt has so many characteristics or traits or qualities that are good for life. And Jesus reckons and regards us as the salt of the earth. I could go on in explaining this, but that's for another sermon. I will simply say in closing that being a disciple requires that Jesus' disciples recognize that Jesus must be first and that Jesus must be everything. In the name of God, who is Father, God who is Son, and God who is Spirit.